Questions about the internet usually revolve around networks, internet as a whole, World Wide Web, fault tolerance, communication protocols, scalability, and sometimes some other things such as IPv6, IPv4, TCP, and other protocols. This question here is just asking about which statements about the internet are true. Let's go ahead and start with the answer. The answer to this one is B. The internet is designed to scale to support the increasing number of users. This is true. This is called scalability. The concept of scalability means that something is able to increase in size to meet some increase in demand. The internet is designed to scale to increasing usage. Let's look at some of these other answers see why they're wrong. It's not true that the internet uses proprietary communication protocols. Keyword here being proprietary. The protocols used by the internet are open protocols. That means that they're known and used and available for everyone to use. C is not correct because although it is recommended that whenever possible you use encryption protocols, they're not required and you can use the internet without using encryption. Making the keyword requires what makes this false. Finally, D is incorrect because the internet is not a centralized system. The word centralized here is the one that's incorrect. In fact, the internet uses a distributed system to determine how packets are routed. The internet is not centralized, meaning located in one place. Rather, it is distributed. It is a set of distributed networks throughout the world. Centralized would imply that there is one big central building where the internet is held, and that is not the case. This question is asking about the difference between World Wide Web and the internet. They sound like the same topic, but they're actually very different, and there are different concepts altogether. The definition of the World Wide Web is what's presented right here. The World Wide Web is a system of linked pages, programs, and files, and the World Wide Web is accessed through the internet. So the World Wide Web uses the internet, not the other way around. You might be more familiar with the World Wide Web, www, as a bunch of websites that are on this thing that you call the internet. This question is a little bit tricky because it actually is calling here the internet a network. That's actually true, but it's a little bit of an understatement. The internet's not really just one network. It's actually a combination of networks, but that in itself can be considered a network. It's a network of networks. So the internet is a network which is composed of many smaller networks. And the World Wide Web uses the internet in order to show a bunch of linked pages, programs, and files. Those are the definitions of these two you should remember. This is the same question, but it gives a different definition for the answer, and it's closer to what we just described. So this one describes the internet as a network of in interconnected networks, and it describes the World Wide Web the same way, a system of linked pages, programs, and files that are accessed via the internet. So this is another way to describe the same answer. Here's a popular question they like to ask about the internet as well. The, it's asking different things, answering them in the form of assigning something to a device when you connect it to the internet. The one you need to remember when this question is asked is that when you connect a device to the internet, such as a new phone or a computer, the internet basically assigns that device an IP address, which is gonna be used to identify that device. An IP address is like a house address but that uniquely identifies your device on the internet. The IP address is used for a variety of things. We're going to use it for communicating between devices. A device knows how to reach another device using its IP address. It's just a number, basically. Now here's another question about IP addresses, but this one is asking about the difference between IPv4 and IPv6. All you really need to know about these is that IPv4 is kind of the older format for IPs. It's shorter, it has 32-bit addresses, Whereas IPv6 is a larger format that allows for many, many more addresses. IPv6 is a 128-bit address format, which means it actually allows for 1,028 times as many IP addresses as IPv4. You don't need to know that number for the exam, but it's good to recognize just how many more addresses you can actually have with IPv6. It allows a lot more machines, a lot more devices to connect to the internet. It was necessary to add IPv6, because as more and more devices connect to the internet, IPv4 starts running out of addresses. The number of addresses IPv4 can connect are roughly 4.3 billion addresses, which seems like a lot, but at some point, the population of the world is more than that, and everyone's going to be connected to the internet with more than one device. So at some point, IPv6 will be necessary for everyone. Now, there are other benefits of IPv6 over IPv4, which are kind of not in the scope of this class. The important benefit of IPv6 versus 4 is this one just right here that we just discussed. It allows for a greater number of addresses than IPv4, which allows for way more devices to be connected to the internet. This is a fairly uncommon question, which is asking about this organization here called the Internet Engineering Task Force, or IETF. 
This is actually a organization which is composed of a bunch of volunteers and participants. It doesn't really have a formal membership structure, roster, or any real requirements for joining. But they're a fairly important organization in that they create the standards and the protocols that are used for the internet and for making the internet work, or at least they enforce them. And they do this through a series of things called RFCs, which are requests for comments. These are basically documents. Now, this organization, basically all it really does is develop these standards and protocols for internet communication. All of these other things are not really centralized in any kind of way. They're not really done by any group. Preventing copyrighted materials from being illegally distributed online is more a job for lawyers and individual companies that enforce these rules. Preventing malicious software is more the job of virus scanners and these types of things. And verifying the ownership of encrypted keys used in secured messages, this is something that a certificate authority, a CA, is responsible for doing. That's not the job of the IETF. Now this question right here is probably the most common question I recall seeing for internet stuff, which is about open standards and protocols. The important thing to know about the internet is that it, op it operates on open standards and protocols. And what that means is it uses protocols such as TCP, IP, HTTP, etc., which are open and known to everyone. So everyone knows how they work and everyone can legally use them. This is in contrast to proprietary protocols and standards, which mean that they're owned by a particular company or business. Now, the benefit of having open standards and protocols is that they do allow different manufacturers, different companies, they allow anyone to be able to use these. So whether you're on a Mac or a Windows computer or a Linux computer, it doesn't matter who built your device, because the internet uses TCP IP, HTTP, and protocols like this, all of them will be able to communicate over the internet without needing to purchase proprietary software or know some secret technology. It's basically open for anyone to use. This is a pretty important concept. Without being able to use open standards and protocols, we wouldn't really be able to communicate over the internet, and this is what allows it. Now, it's important to notice that the concept of open and standard protocols does not impact anything about the efficiency of how this stuff works, so it doesn't really eliminate latency. It's not something it does. Also, the concept of being able to freely share and reuse material this is a copyright issue or a Creative Commons type of issue. It doesn't really have anything to do with these open standards and protocols. This one's just trying to trick you into thinking it's talking about the same thing. And finally, the fact that you could have software that contains no errors is uh, pretty laughable. This is a rephrasing of the previous question. This one is asking, starting with the protocols, as we have TCP and IP, and they're using communication, but what is the purpose of that? The answer as before here is that we have these common protocols in order for us to be able to establish a common standard for sending and receiving messages between different devices. By having common protocols, we know how the messages have to be sent, how they have to be packaged, and how they can be received and transferred. So both devices can communicate those messages pretty easily. In the case of this particular example, TCP and IP are used in combination in order to send messages between devices, as is described right here, sending messages between two devices on the internet. IP is responsible for identifying the location of the senders and receivers. TCP is responsible for packaging up and rearranging the messages. Now this question here is asking about a specific protocol, and that is the TCP protocol. TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol which means that it's a protocol that deals with transmitting messages across a network. What you need to know about TCP is that the way it works is basically by breaking messages up into individual components called packets. A packet contains a bunch of information about where that message is going, who sent it, the message itself, and pretty importantly as well, the order of that packet. For example, if you broke a packet into 10 pieces, it would contain numberings for each of the pieces stating the order of that packet number maybe from 1 to 10 stating which one is the first second third etc what's very important to know about tcp is that when you send the packets you do not expect to send or receive them in the same order that means that whoever is receiving the packets knows how many they're going to get they know they're going to get 10 or 20 but they're going to receive those packets potentially in the wrong order and it's on them to rearrange and reassemble the packets in the right order. So you will use the number for those to figure out what order they're supposed to be in and rearrange them. That's described over here. 
The file is broken into packets for transmission. The packets must be reassembled upon receipt. The second option here sounds almost correct, except for this part. It says the user's browser must request each packet in order until all packets are received. It does need to wait for all the packets in order to get the full message, but it does not receive them in order, so that's incorrect. It receives them in a random order. Options C and D describe a situation in which an entire packet is sent on its own, basically in its entirety. That's not how TCP works. That's not how messages are transferred. Now let's end with one last question. This is another one that's just a vocabulary one, basically. So this one's saying that we have a router and it's configured to limit bandwidth. So basically the question is, what does bandwidth do? The bandwidth is defined as basically the maximum rate of data which you can transfer across a specific path. So think about maybe across a wire, how much data can you transfer per second over that wire? It's usually measured in data per second, bytes per second, bits per second, something along those lines. Modern hardware generally measures this in kilobits, megabits, or gigabits per second, given the strength of the bandwidth which we have these days. Remember that one megabit per second means one million bits per second. Now based on that definition, the answer here will be D. Guests would be restricted with the maximum amount of data that they can send and receive per second. Basically, if you lower the bandwidth for these guests, they will be able to receive less data per second. Notice that A is pretty close, but it's actually the opposite. A states that the amount of time it would take for them to receive a big file would decrease. It's actually the opposite. It would increase. But it's on the same topic. It's just the wrong direction. Now B is a bit of a trick one because it's talking about the number of packets required for guests to send and receive data is likely to decrease. It's not going to affect the number of packets that are required. The number of packets is still going to be the same. You're going to send the same amount of data. It's just going to take longer to send it. And finally, C is talking about fault tolerance. So lowering the bandwidth is not going to make things less fault tolerant. That's a totally separate concept. Bandwidth is talking about the speed, the rate of transfer, not whether or not you can transfer at all. Thanks for watching. I'm Flavio, and I'll be back with more soon.